I want to get into the good news. That's our series title this Christmas. You know, several years ago when I lived in Oregon, and I believe that this happened either right before we had kids or maybe right after Gavin was born. I came home from a church function. I was out late. Tina was at home. And I came home after work, after ministry at the church. And I came walking in the door and Tina was sitting on the couch with a blanket and probably some hot cocoa or something on the couch. And I, wa- I looked at the TV and I saw on the television these beautiful elaborate sets, you know, on the movie set with uh, Christmas decorations and, you know, and all these things. And I thought, oh, Tina's watching a Christmas movie. I, I want to get in a little Christmas spirit, a little Christmas joy. And so I decided I want to put my stuff down. I'm going to get on the couch and snuggle with Tina, get in the Christmas spirit until the movie kept going. And I thought to myself, what is happening? This is not a Christmas movie. This is not a Christmas movie. And I watched in horror as what I thought was a Christmas movie, like maybe like the Hallmark movies she was just talking about or all that stuff. I watched as this movie was not about Christmas at all. It was about a little boy whose mother was dying. And his mother was dying from some virus that had caused a heart failure. And his only goal in life was to collect enough cans to raise enough money to buy his mother red dancing shoes. So when she dies, she can look pretty in heaven. I don't know if you've seen this. Anybody seen this movie, Christmas Shoes? This is not a Christmas movie. Do not believe it for one second. I don't care. How many little Christmas decorations are on the cover of this movie? It is not a Christmas movie. It was all a blur. And all of a sudden, I hear Tina looking at me going, are you crying? And I'm sitting on the couch and like my manlyhood is gone. I am bawling. I'm going, of course I'm crying. Do you see what's happening on the television? That's the saddest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm just wail- I'm wailing. <laughs> he lost his mom at Christmas. I was just like, I was just beside myself. And every time that movie gets brought up, and you know now they made a song about it that they play on K-Love. <laughs> Tina brings it up and begins to laugh every time this movie is mentioned. <laughs> And goes, remember that time when you were bawling on the couch? Remember that time? It's a funny story, but it makes an important point. Bad news doesn't take a break during the holidays. Bad news doesn't take a break. We're in the season, the world that we're living in right now, and the bad news that we've been having this year isn't taking a break. We're sitting in a sanctuary that's not as full as it would normally be on Christmas having one service when typically we'd have two full services. We're sitting in a day where people are losing their livelihoods. We're sitting in a day where people are going to have, like this Christmas season, an empty chair that they didn't have last year. This stuff, the world stuff, the ugly stuff, doesn't take a break just because Christmas comes. And the reality is that we have to face this reality in our lives that that bad news doesn't take a break. People are going to be picking up the pieces of bankruptcy this year. Christmas hospitals are going to be filled to over capacity this year during Christmas. The hospitals are going to be filled. And people this season of Christmas are dealing with grief and fear and depression and addiction. It's not taking a break. The night that Jesus was born and our Savior came into the world that he had created, it was dark then also. Very dark. We know this because the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9 tells us how dark it was. It says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Isaiah is making no bones about it. 
The season in which Jesus enters into the world is dark. It's not just dark. Darkness is not even enough to describe it. He has to add an adjective. Deep darkness. John chapter 1 lets us know that it was dark. John says this, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. In the days of Jesus' birth, the land was in great darkness. Oppressive government rule. You think we're being oppressed now? We have no idea. We have no idea compared to what it was then. There were many divisions among God's people on who should be in charge of God's people in the, in the land of God. The Roman moral decay and excess had found its way into the culture of the Jews and in, even in the temple. People had lost hope in God's rescue. There was no spiritual activity to be found because culture, uh, the culture uh, uh, was broken and the temple priests had become political pulpit, uh, puppets of the Roman ruler. It is upon this dark backdrop, in this darkness of night, in a field far away from the city lights, that the angel showed up and declared, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Luke writes this recorded account in Luke chapter 2. The angels said this, we bring you good news, great joy in this darkness. And they spoke of a joy, a joy that people didn't have at the moment, but they were sure to have once they received the good news that had been delivered. We know what the good news is. We know what the good news is. We're fortunate to now have been past all of that story and past all of God's redemptive plan that had taken place on the earth to the point where we now have access to this good news. We know what the good news was of the message that night that the angel shared. But we have to remember what the good news does. We know what it is. We have to remember what it does. It is the source of joy for all people, the angel said. Now, there's a surprising meaning in the Greek original language that the Bible is written in for the word all. It means all. All. Not all, as in all the shepherds in the field, or all the people in Bethlehem, or all the people in Israel, or all the people in the world of that time and space. It means all, the totality of every person that is living or will live. All. Bring good uh, joy to all people. This is important for us to understand because we have this tendency as American 20th century, 1st century believers to listen to a message like this and a verse like this and to think, isn't that special? <laughs> Jesus brought good news to those people living in darkness in Israel. No, it was all people. Good news of great joy is all people then and all people now. For you and for me, for our coworkers and our friends and our neighbors and our families, this good news has brought joy and is continuing to bring joy every moment and every second of every day in every culture and every language and every tongue and every tribe. Good news for all people. Amen. This is the thing that we need to understand today. The angels were declaring good news for all peoples in all times and in all places and in all circumstances that we today have the ability to participate in joy because of the good news impact on them. The effects of bad news may not take a break. That's true. That's true. And we have to acknowledge that today. But good news of salvation also doesn't take a break. And it is at work here today and every day. There is a savior of the world who did not stay distant when our world got dark. He came close 
We have to remember what John sh- sh- uh, said. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. When you start feeling your world feel dark, and it's easy to do these days, remember there is a light that cannot be overcome. And he is available for us today. He came close. There is hope that no matter how dark something seems, no matter how dark it may feel, there is a light that pierces that darkness who wants to come close to us today. The good news is that there is a savior. There is an answer for our world, for our brokenness, for our sin, and he has come. He has shown up. He has pushed back darkness. He has come near to set free those who are trapped by the darkness, those who are burdened by heaviness, and to bring peace in every turmoil, in every conflict. The gospel does not for one moment pretend that there's no darkness. The gospel just lets us know that the darkness is not all there is. That there is a light and he has come and he is available for you and for me and for all people. He is powerful. He is our savior. And the angels might have declared the good news 2,000 years ago, but that good news is still producing great joy for all people today who will receive it. Today I wanna talk to you about the good news and how it should operate in our lives. We know what it is, but how should it operate in our lives? Once we've received it, once we've taken hold of it, once we've made a deposit of it in our lives, how should it operate? Once we are the recipient of good news, how should it affect our response? How does it intersect our faith? How does it affect the way we live it out? The Christmas story involves more moving pieces and parts than sometimes we recognize. We have our little manger scenes and we put them up and I, we've got a couple and I've got a little special one I brought home from Israel made out of olive wood. And, it just, and it's beautiful and it's cute and it's, and it's all the trappings of, of for us what Christmas is. But there's more moving parts and more moving pieces that literally have been in operation for hundreds and thousands of years that God is just bringing and aligning together to bring to us what Christmas is. And one of those pieces is how the story of salvation involved two people that you may not put in your Christmas story, Zachariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. And her husband, Zachariah, was from the Levite tribe, meaning he was a priest and she was also from the Levite tribe, meaning, and the priest it carried out the priestly duty all the way back from the time when they were ex, uh, uh, delivered out of exile in Egypt. They would carry out the priestly duties in the temple, and Zechariah was fulfilling his uh, responsibility, his obligation in the temple when we read the story that we're going to read. But it means that they were from the tribe of priests. And God used this couple and the righteous lives that they lived to be part of the good news story of him coming to earth. Joseph and Mary were not the only ones in the Christmas story receiving messages from angels about babies. Zechariah also received a message from an angel. The priest, Zachariah, was working in his annual duty in the temple. Now, back then, the, the, the temple was staffed by the people from the tribe of uh, the Levite tribe. And it was his annual duty as a, a tribe of Levi, uh, from the tribe of Levite to serve in the temple two weeks out of every year. And as he was in his duty, his two weeks of service in the temple, the angel Gabriel appears to him with a message as he was preparing incense on the altar for worship in the temple. And Gabriel showed up and told Zechariah that he and his wife Elizabeth would have a son and God would use him. Elizabeth had been barren and her and Zechariah were way old, way past the, ch- the years of childbirth and childbearing uh, years. And although they had always wanted a child, it had never happened for them. 
You ever been in a place where it seems to happen for other people, but not for me? That's the moment. It didn't happen for them. They were living in a disappointment, but it didn't stop them from living the righteous lives that God had called them to. What a lesson in faith. Their obedience never stopped. Their worship of God never stopped. And here in this place of service, Zechariah gets a message. There are a few things in this story that I believe challenge us on how we are to engage the good news, how it is supposed to engage us when it comes after we've received it. I want to start in Luke chapter 1, and we'll spend most of our time there this morning. Luke chapter 1 and verse 11, and read you this account and share with you about how good news should engage our faith lives. It says this, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side uh, of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped by fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. Sounds like some good news. Listen to Zechariah's response to the good news in verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Husbands, don't ever say that about your wives. Zechariah hears the good news. An angel of the Lord has appeared to him in the physical realm, in the temple, as he's serving his priestly duties, and said, God has sent me here to give you this message. And he goes, how can this be? Have you seen my wife? She's kind of old. Not exactly the faith response I think Gabriel was looking for in that moment. And the angel said to him in verse 19, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent here to speak to you, to tell you this good news. The first thing that we need to take out of this message today in the scripture is this, that we need to let the good news inform our circumstances. Let the good news inform your circumstances. Zechariah clearly believed in God. If he didn't, he would not have committed his whole life to live, to honor him, and to live a righteous life. And if he believes in God, which he clearly does, he would have believed all the stories that were passed down to him throughout the scriptures, throughout the teaching of the priest. He would have believed that God was capable of doing more supernatural things than he already knew about in the scriptures, able to provide for his people in impossible ways, able to demonstrate his faithfulness against all odds. Zechariah, this was like what he did. He was a priest. He grew up in the faith. He took hold of the faith. He believed in the faith, and he believed in the God of the faith. And yet... When the message of good news hits his doorstep, he's having a hard time buying it. Supernatural moment happens in his own life and the angel tells him good news of God's plan of provision and his response is, how can this happen? How are you asking that question about a God that you have believed in your whole life that, has been do that you believe does supernatural things? When the supernatural God of miracles delivers news on his doorstep, he cannot bring his mind and his heart to a place of faith and believe that it can happen for his own life. As a result, the angel told him, you're not going to be able to speak until this miracle comes to pass. And Zachariah spends the next nine months mute because he did not believe. The angel Gabriel answers with authority. I'm one of the few creatures in heaven and earth that get to stand in the full presence of God. And he himself has sent me to you to deliver this message. You better catch what's going on here, Zechariah. 
It's a drop the mic moment. You are not picking up what I'm laying down. That is what he's saying. He delivers this moment. And he calls into question in this message Zachariah's ability to merge what he knows about God, what he believes about God, and the good news he's receiving, and merge all of that with his reality and the disappointment that he's had to live. He can't put those two things together and he can't merge those. And the angel is calling it out. You've believed in this God. I've been sent from this God. I have good news for you. It doesn't matter what your circumstances have been. I'm telling you, this is the way it's gonna be. You see, Zechariah had to let his good news inform his circumstances. Are you catching that struggle? You see, here's the deal. We know the good news, but do we know the good news and that we let it interact with our lives in such a way where we can merge what we believe about God with the reality we've had to live? You see, the disconnect for Zechariah is his circumstances. Maybe it sounds familiar to you, this thing Zechariah's thinking. God, I know what you did but I also know what I've lived. Anybody feel familiar? We sit in church and we hear about this God and we believe in him. I'm not questioning anybody's faith in here to believe in this God, to believe what he did, to believe any stories in the scripture, in the Bibles. But when the good news comes to our doorstep, can we merge what he did and who he is and what he promises to do in our lives with the realities and some of the disappointments that have transpired in our lives? And Zachariah, I mean, Gabriel is calling this into question in Zachariah's life. It's not, uh, excuse me, if you don't watch out, circumstances will talk louder to you than the God we say we put our trust in. It's not that God isn't speaking. It is can we hear him over the things that are yelling at us and yelling in our spirit and yelling in our hearts and yelling in our minds that are happening in our circumstances. Can we hear him? Can we hear God over the disappointment? It's not a question of whether God's speaking or not. Can you hear him over the fear? Can you hear him over your grief? Can you hear him over the turmoil in your family? Can you hear him over your financial destruction? Can you hear him over the threat of politicians, broken leadership, and overreach? Can you hear him over uh, the diagnosis you've received? It's not the question of if God's speaking. The question is, can you hear him over your circumstances yelling at you? You have to inform your circumstances of the good news. Good news has come. As the angels filled the sky over the shepherd's fields, the night, the message of good news for a savior, for all people, all people has been proclaimed. Do you hear it? All people. Do you hear the message of good news? What the angel Gabriel was telling Zachariah and what he wants to say to you and to me today is that God has good news for you. You need to inform your circumstances that something's going to shift. Something's going to take place. Something's going to change. There is going to be something that is going to take place because the power of God is here. He's here. Today is the time for you to inform your circumstances of the good news of a Savior who is active in your life. Speak to your disappointment about your good news. There's no question, and the gospel does not try to paint over it or smooth over it or ignore the fact that there's disappointment that lives in our life. Like Zechariah, who believed his whole life and wanted and desired his whole life for a son and never got it. There are things that exist in your heart and in your life that have not transpired, have not come to pass the way you wanted them to. Or worse yet, you've had to grieve the loss of things that you desired. And they seem to have died. The gospel does not gloss over and does not ignore those realities in our life. 
But the gospel does proclaim that there is a savior who will show up and he brings his power in the midst of those things and that we need to take those circumstances and lay them before him and inform those circumstances. Listen, I know what I've been dealt, but I also know who I serve. I inform my circumstances of the God of good news. Speak to that disappointment and say, I know I'm disappointed, but I'm trusting God for this thing. Speak to your fear. Well, I know this thing makes me shake and fear in the reality of my heart of what's going on, but I'm speaking to you fear today. I believe, I know I've been given a savior today and I know he will come through for me. Speak to your disappointment. Speak to your financial need. Speak to your diagnosis. Lord, I'm trusting you. You are the savior then and you are the savior now. And I'm informing the things that I'm walking through of who I serve. I'm a child who's received good news. I don't know how. I don't know when. This is the confession of faith. I don't know how. And I don't know when. But I am convinced of this. The Savior who set me free from my sin will come through for me will come through for me. That's the statement of faith. You can't mark it up. You can't write out the plan. I know we try. We say, okay, Lord, if we can just, if we can do one and then two and three. Okay, here's the plan. That's not how this works. I know how, I don't know how, and I don't know when, but my Savior will come through for me. That is the message of the good news of Emmanuel who showed up in the darkness. Second thought to us today is this. Deliver the good news to others who are in need of it. This is how good news should interact with our lives and intersect with our lives. The angel Gabriel continues with his message to Zechariah by telling him what will take place as a result of this miracle of provision of the Lord in, in, in their life. Listen to Luke chapter 1, verse 15 through 17. Gabriel says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, how many of you like to, to have the Lord speak this over your children? He will never, uh, he is to never take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he, was, he is born. He will bring back many to the, uh, of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in spirit and in power of Elijah and turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Gabriel says, let me tell you something about the good news you've received. It's not just supposed to stay in your house. It's not just supposed to stay in your house. I'm glad you've received it, and I believe your heart will come around to believe it. But once you've received it, once you've accepted it, once you've, well, you've believed and stand in faith on it, it's not supposed to stay in your house. This good news is going to affect others around you. It's supposed to be given away. Good news is supposed to be spoken about. Good news is supposed to be shared. The Old Testament declared that there would be a messenger sent before the Messiah who walked in the power of Elijah. And this uh, prophecy is being fulfilled now in John the Baptist. The prophecy is being fulfilled through Zechariah's son. And the good news of God's supernatural work in his life was not just to be enjoyed by him and Elizabeth. The work of God was going to be shared with the world and the world would be changed because of it. Zechariah had a long time to think about that message. Nine months exactly. No speaking. Nine months of being shut down, of being able to whine and complain. Nine months of his questioning shut down. Just him alone, unable to communicate with anybody else except for God. He had a long time to process this message of the good news and what it should do in his life. He had a, a, a long time to process about what this good news, how it should be delivered, how it should be processed, how it should be enacted in his faith. And for nine months, he had to ponder about the angel's message, to search the scriptures and to read about what God had promised about this Messiah and begin to let his heart well up with praise. For nine months, he had time to deal with his own unbelief between him and God. By the way, side note, 
God knows how to isolate you when you need to be isolated so you can process what he's doing in your life. I hate when I have to make him bring me to that. Did you catch what I said? I hate when I have to make him bring me to that. When I didn't respond right the first time. But he will help us process one way or the other. This is what he's doing with Zechariah. And on this day, after uh, John the Baptist is born, and the birth of Zechariah's son has come about. Zechariah's mouth was open, and he broke out in the Holy Spirit and began to sing a worship song that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, an inspired worship song as he began to prophesy in faith over his son. And he says in Luke chapter 1, 76 and 79, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare a way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation, through the forgiveness of their sins, because the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness in the, and in the shadow of death, to get, uh, guide our feet into the pathway of peace. What is Zachariah's first words out of his mouth when he begins to speak again after nine months? He begins to shout the glory and the good news of God and not keep it in his household. He's already prophesying that this good news that has come to my house is going to be a source for joy for all people, whoever we come in contact with. He's proclaiming good news is going to be delivered, is going to be shared and given to others who are in need of it. When God delivers good news in your life, it's not supposed to be kept to yourself. Every one of you in this room has a story of God's faithfulness. Every one of you has a story of how God has seen you through, answered your prayer, brought his word to bear, restored what was broken. Every one of you has a story of good news because if you didn't, you would not be here on Sunday morning. You'd be sleeping in bed in this rainy uh, morning. You're here because God brought good news to your household. That good news is supposed to be shared and not kept to ourselves, given away. The good news is a catalyst for salvation. Good news is a vehicle of God's transformation. God changed the whole world by the good news that came and through those people who would partner and give it and were willing to share it with others. God changed the whole world. How did God change the whole world through a group of disciples because they were willing to take the good news they re received and give it away. So often we receive good news of God's work in our life and we keep it to ourselves. There's a famous quote by Mark Twain that often gets told a lot in our culture, especially now, and we often use it in the realm of politics, but I want to take it into the realm of the church for a minute. Mark Tw Twain said this, he says, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still lacing up its boots. Isn't that true? The bad news always seems to circulate a lot faster, isn't it? Now you know what the good news is, right? All throughout scripture, the good news is, being, is labeled as truth. The truth, he's the way, the truth, and the life. I wanna just apply that to scripture and apply that to our spiritual lives for a minute. It's, why is it that the bad news seems to make it halfway around the world while the church and its good news is still lacing up its boots? Why is that, why is that happening? Because we are not living the mandate of engaging this good news not only on my, in my house, but sharing it and giving it away. The good news is the truth of God's salvation for all men. But bad news is what we so often fixate upon. It's so often what we talk about. It's so often to be the first thing that leaves our mouth, even as believers. Are you catching this? Why does the world know more about how the church feels about Governor Newsom? Why is it that the world knows more about how the church feels about the election we just had? Why is it that the church, uh, the world around us knows more about how we feel about things that are happening in our world and the things that are 
making us mad or frustrating us or how bad it is in California and how miserable it is. Why do they know more about how we feel about those things than about the truth of the gospel that lives inside of us that will change their life forever? The thing that you and I talk the most about is what we dwell on the most. It's pretty hard to talk about good news after you just got done telling everybody how bad it is. I know I can feel the conviction starting to settle. Why isn't it the first thing out of our mouth about the good news of salvation? It doesn't matter what happens in all those other things. I mean, we can want what we want, and we can vote who we want to vote for, and we can think about the things, we, but why isn't the thing out of our mouth about this good news that has hit our doorstep, this miraculous salvation that has come, this Emmanuel who has shined his light in the darkness, and that no matter how much the COVID statistics get higher and higher and higher, there is still a light that cannot be overcome by the darkness. And he's still working, and he's still saving, and he's still setting people free, and he's still transforming, and you have this good news in your heart, in your life, and we got to share it, somebody. we got to share it with somebody. The story of this Christmas is not how COVID has robbed us of our transitions, and doesn't it feel weird? That's not the story of Christmas 2020. The world does not have to be reminded of how dark it is. They already know. They're uniquely familiar with the darkness. They don't need to be reminded. You don't have to tell them. The message of Christmas this year and the message of Christmas every year is that the King of glory has come. Emmanuel has come to rescue us. The light is shining in the darkness. There's a way out of the darkness. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. You can be saved. You can be set free. Your shame can be renewed. Your life can have a new start. There's a Savior. His name is Jesus. And He's here. He's here. That's the story of Christmas 2020. And it may feel dark, but the light is still shining. And you have the light. Give it away. That's how we're supposed to engage with the good news of Jesus Christ. I know it's true. Because He did it for me. I know it's true because he did it for you. I've seen it. I've watched you change. I've seen it. I know it's true. There are people who are in desperate need of good news you have experienced in your life that has come to your doorstep. And the world is dark. It's true. But you are the messengers of the light. There's no plan B. There's no plan B. And when you read Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, I hope to God that you put your name in this verse. How then can they call on the one who have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's me. That's me. That's you. How beautiful are your feet when you will step into somebody else's darkness and you will say, let me share with you the good news. And let me tell you what it did for me. And let me tell you what it can do for you. We gotta share this good news and give it away to others. Number three this morning is this. Decide to make good news the source of your joy. Decide to make good news the source of your joy. Zachariah's unborn son in the womb of Elizabeth is at the center of one of the most powerful moments of the Christmas story. I love this moment in scripture in Luke chapter one. After Mary had become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, she traveled to her cousin Elizabeth's house because, you know, after all, family's safe, right? Mary's like, I gotta share this with somebody, but I'm not sure anybody can handle this. I need to get someone with somebody who I know believes in God and who, don't, who loves me and won't betray me. And I need, I need to like process this with somebody. So she runs to Mary's, uh, Elizabeth's house. And we see Mary, the mother of Jesus, expectant of this baby that has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. Overwhelmed in joy in her ability to participate in God's master plan. And she's running to Elizabeth's house to share, to process. 
Listen to this interaction in Luke chapter 1, 39 through 44. It says, at the time Mary got ready and she hurried off, uh, hurried to town in, uh, in a hill uh, country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is your child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The Holy Spirit revealed something to Elizabeth that Mary didn't even have to tell her. And she says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. John the Baptist before he breathed his first breath outside his mother's womb, recognized the spirit of Emmanuel, showed up in his room where he was at. And it was, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he recognized good news has shown up in my house. Baby John was so sensitive to the presence of good news. I've never called John the Baptist baby John, but I like it. (laughs) Baby John was so sensitive to the presence of good news that when the Savior showed up in the room, he leaped for joy. He leaped for joy. Do we still leap for joy when the presence of our Savior walks in the room with us? Do we still leap for joy when we know we can be in the presence of God? Sunday's coming. (laughs) We're gonna worship. Pastor Ashley's gonna lead us. It's gonna be awesome. It's going to be great. Pastor Lance is going to be over there pointing. It's going to be in the presence of God. Amen. We still leap for joy when the presence, we have a chance to be in the presence of God. Amen. He's the source. Yeah. He's the source. He's the source of our joy. But this year has been hard. I call this year the stripping year. Just stripping stuff away. Just been stripping stuff away. Oh, you want oh you want to do that? Oh no, you can't do that anymore. No oh, you like doing this? Okay. Okay, you can't do that anymore. No oh, you want to celebrate your kids' graduation? Oh no, you're not doing that anymore. No You've been looking forward to it for 18 years. No, no, we're not doing that anymore. No <laughs> just stripping away. Just stripping away. Unlike a season that we that most of us in this room have not gone through. And let me tell you something about this season. All this season is doing, listen, there's nothing unique about this season. There's been other stripping away seasons that have happened in our world. You know this, right? This has happened before. Stripping away seasons is doing nothing more other than confirming the word of God we already knew. We already knew this. We already knew this. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter three, the Bible talks about how, and Paul says this. He says, I laid a foundation of the good news. I laid it down for you. I gave you the best foundation you've ever received of good news. It came to your house. It says how you build this now from here on out is gonna be how you're gonna live your faith. The house you build on this foundation. That's your life. And if you build with hay, And things that burn, instead of gold and silver and things that will remain, when the fire comes, it's going to burn it away. This is what Paul says to the church in Corinth. He says, when the fire comes, that means Paul knows fire's coming. This world has fire in it. And all this season has done, all this year 2020 has done, is revealed to us what we built on the foundation of the good news. That's all it's done. It's revealed to us what we've taken stock in, what we put our hope in, what we put our joy in, what filled our time, what filled our thoughts, what filled our priorities. And the fire's just come and burned it. And the only thing that is left is the things of eternity. It's the only thing that's left. It's the only thing that counts. It's the only thing that will sustain. It was the only thing that will fill you during this time is the things of eternity. That's the only thing. It's the only thing that's going to calm your fear. It's the only thing that's going to bring you peace. It's the only thing that's going to bring you joy. The Bible has told us that this kind of things happen in our lives all the time. This season is just confirming God's word. 
And the scripture teaches us that the source of our joy should be him. Should be him. See, if, if we go through 2020, and 2020 just, you know, after taking our habits and it took our routines and it took some of our health and it took some of our money and it took, if, it, if after all that, it didn't just take those things, but it also took our joy, Something's wrong. Because those things are not the source of our joy. God is the source of our joy. And it is found in him and him alone. The good news comes to, down to God, Emmanuel, is with us. That's our joy. It's the source of our joy. It's the source of our strength. Does your heart leap in the presence of God? Pastor Ashley, come. Does it leap in the presence of God? Does the presence of God make you hopeful that things can change? That miracles can happen. That salvation can be yours. You can still experience joy in Christmas 2020. It's the good news. His name is Jesus. That's our joy. Jesus is our joy. Jesus is our joy. There's no other source. Every other source will be burned away. And you will have nothing left to depend on other than Jesus. And he's here. That's the good news. Emmanuel, right? That means in this room. Why don't you stand with me? In this room. In this room. Jesus is here. In your living room, watching online. Jesus is there. Emmanuel, the source of our joy. He's here today to save. He's here today to wash away your sin. He's here today to set you free. He's here today to heal you. He's here today to comfort you. He's here today to provide for you. He's here today to restore you. Jesus is our joy. You can leap. There's a reason to leap. You're not going to look stupid. Because he has been, he is, and he will always be. There's no disappointment in that source. And he doesn't let us down. And he doesn't not keep his word. He's our source. Would you bow your heads? Just bow your heads. Let your spirit begin to speak to you today. Let God's begin to speak to your spirit. Let your heart leap for joy. Because Jesus is in the room. He's the source of your joy during this Christmas season. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I'm not going to argue with you. There are things that seem dark. But the good news is that Jesus is here. And and Elizabeth said it best in the last scripture of that encounter in verse 45. Elizabeth said it to Mary after she responded in faith. Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Blessed are you who believes that the Lord will fulfill his promise to you. Blessed. Blessed. Savior, I'm asking that you just begin to speak to some people right now. There's some people that walked in, Lord, they felt like they were on fire. They felt like they were on fire. And everything was just getting burned. Lord Jesus, today, would you help them find the source, the source of joy, the good news, Emmanuel. Today, I want you just to begin to spend a moment. I want you to begin to talk to him about what's on your heart. Maybe you've never even received Jesus for the ever in your life. Not for one, not one time have you ever said, Jesus, be my savior, forgive me of my sins. In these next few moments, I want you to talk to the Lord, the Savior, Emmanuel, our joy and our hope about what you're walking through, about what's got your attention, about what's shouting to you in your circumstance. And I want you to begin to let him speak to your spirit and show you he's worthy to be trusted as Ashley just sings through this song. In your presence we are undone Here in your presence 
presence, heaven and earth become one. Spirit begin to feel it. Here in your presence. Emmanuel, Savior, striding. All things are new. In your circumstance. Here in your presence, everything bows before. Let's sing that one more time. Here in your prayer. 